Well, welcome back to In the Word, and hate to start like this, but I feel like I need to apologize. I've come behind in the reading list. I'm not a very good example for you guys, but I have uh, come behind in the reading list, uh, reading plan, and uh, unavoidable in some ways. Uh, I've got uh, teaching responsibilities at the church where I serve, as well as uh, um, a lot of tasks uh, my wife and I are pursuing as we uh, close out a estate from her parents. So that's my whining. Sorry about that. And uh, But on the other hand, what a glorious uh, dilemma to fall into uh, to be uh, teaching at my church three times a week as well as uh, teaching online. So what a glorious opportunity that the Lord has given me, and I do appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you as well, that you're sticking in there, and I appreciate your financial contribution and support, and I'm going to do my best to uh, stay up to date. Uh, today we're going to be in chapter 13 of Zechariah. We're closing in on the end of the uh, second to the last book in this series of the Minor Prophets. I, I pray it's been as rich for you as, as it is for me. Uh, this is, uh, as you can imagine, I've gone through the Minor Prophets uh, before and uh, every time I find new reasons to uh, be rejoice and be amazed and be encouraged and be edified uh, from these books. So we are in chapter 13 and uh, where we are is this last oracle, this oracle of restoration. And it opens um, with this um, um, false prophets and it's kind of a response to the previous chapter as you may recall or maybe go back there and look again the last chapter closes with this period of uh, repentance and mourning and in light of this great mourning then I think the connection here is in light of that this fountain of forgiveness is springing up and uh, along these lines that the uh, Lord is uh, purifying his people these false prophets are going to be removed from the land. Um, it's kind of a sudden change here. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. So the picture is here is uh, flowing waters coming out from uh, the throne of David in Jerusalem that's uh, washing clean the nation. It says, in, come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, in chapter 13 of verse 2. I will cut off the names of idols from the land, and they will no longer be remembered. I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. So here are the things that have been plaguing Israel, these false prophets, these idols, and behind it all, this unclean spirit, behind it all, Satan. And God is going to clean house, we can say. Uh, that he is going to uh, be bringing all this to an end. And then he focuses in on the false prophets here. The false prophets will be coming to an end in verses 3 through 6. Uh, they're gonna, the danger is going to be recognized. Uh, the repulsion is going to be recognized. That's, uh, um, the, the remnant is going to be uh, so uh, abhorred by the presence of false prophets among them that even parents will be willing to have their own children put to death if those children are false prophets. What a, um, what a drastic uh, response to false prophecy. It says in verse 4 that it will also come about in that day that the prophets will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. And they will put on a hair, they will put on a hairy robe. They will not put on a hairy robe in order to deceive. So the, pro the false prophets, uh, their eyes will be opened. Uh, they'll be disgusted. They'll be ashamed. This will lead to their repentance. That hairy robe he's talking about is uh, kind of the distinctive uh, clothing. I think this stands for not only the clothing, but the distinctive lifestyle of these prophets. Uh, they're going to put those all away. And in verse 5, even deny that they're prophets. Uh, they're going to say they're uh, not a prophet. I'm a farmer. Um, sold me as a slave. I've been a farmer from my youth. Uh, so they're going to be dis continuing to deceive people uh, to hide their false prophecy. Verse 6 might be a little confusing. What is he talking about here? These wounds between your arms. 
Um, some people think that this is a reference to uh, Jesus, the true prophet, in contrast to the false prophets. I think what this is is um, a picture of the result of their kind of frenetic, uh, idolatrous worship, where they'd cut themselves to show their devotion to their God. Uh, they bleed, and uh, you can see actually videos of this uh, from mu some Muslim worship rituals that even go on today where they're cutting themselves and bleeding profusely as a sign of devotion. And I think that's what he's talking about here. He's going to deny they did that and say, well, I was wounded uh, in the house of my friends. I wasn't fatal. These are just cuts, and uh, I was wounded there. So we see this: these false prophets are going to come to the end. Idolatry is going to come to an end. Uh, the Lord is uh, really cleaning house. And then in verse 7, we see this sudden and kind of shocking turn and uh, catches our attention for a number of reasons. First, the, the um, imperative there, awake, O sword. So wake up. And what is he addressing here? He's addressing an inanimate object. So that's the second thing that gets our attention. Um, and he sends it against my shepherd. Um, uh, this is the Lord speaking. He's sending it against my shepherd. Notice in the next verse, or the next uh, stanza there, it says, my associate, uh, the word there, associate, is, uh, translates a, a Hebrew word, amat. Uh, it's used to describe uh, ancestral or ethnic ties. Well, it's, this is interesting. The Lord is describing his shepherd as a, kind of an ancestor. Uh, we might say, in light of the New Testament, a son. We can see this again as we go down in this verse, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Uh, of course, this is uh, Jesus's words. He applied them to himself in uh, Matthew 26, 31. And um, this is coming in the middle of a section that talks about uh, God's restoration of his people, Israel, which should get our attention. Uh, this is um, necessary, that this is a necessary part of Israel's restoration is that God's associate, as again, this is Jesus, uh, is going to be struck. Uh, we can, uh, if I was preaching this, I'd talk about the substitutionary atonement of the Lord and how he's taken sins for all people upon himself, but uh, I won't preach right now. I'll stick with the passage here that this is going to be a um, necessary thing that is uh, um, uh, Messiah, his son, is going to be struck and his followers will be scattered. Verse 8 is a very somber prophecy of the win winnowing that's going to happen in Israel. will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish and a third part will be left. And I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver, test them as gold. Well, what's going on here is that this is the winnowing of Israel that's happening in this period and time of purification. Two-thirds of the nation are going to perish in unbelief. I think this is going to happen during the tribulation period uh, uh, covered in Revelation 6 through 19. Uh, they are surviving third of Israel is going to be tested and refined by the tribulation. But ultimately, they're going to confess their faith. Uh, look at the end of verse 9. After they're tested, they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. So that the end of this period of testing and winnowing, they're going to call on the Lord in this case, it's going to be uh, confess their faith in the Messiah. It's interesting. You can align this, cross-reference this with Matthew 23, 39, where Jesus tells Israel that he will not return, that he's, he will not come in the second coming until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what is it going to take for the Lord Jesus to return to the earth? his people Israel to turn to him in mass and all Israel will be saved as Paul tells us. 
Uh, again, this is not a precondition for the rapture. The rapture can happen at any time. We as the church could go be with the Lord at any moment. Uh, this is a precondition, though, for his second advent, that people will call on him. So let's just think about this for a minute. You know, as the church, we read these verses, and it's kind of amazing, uh, edifying, even comforting in some ways to see the Lord's severe, saving, and sanctifying love for Israel. He just never gives up on them, no matter what their past has been, uh, no matter what kind of resistance, even in the very, to the very last days, two-thirds of the nation are going to turn away from him. Uh, nevertheless, he sticks with that remnant. Well, this same Lord who loves them so much also loves his church. He is uh, for Israel, and they'll read these verses during the future tribulation, and the remnant will call out the Messiah. I pray today that as you read these verses and come to see the Lord's great love for you, that you would reciprocate in great love for him. God bless you, brothers and sisters.